Hello fellow homebrewers, JP here, and I want to introduce to you the brand new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Series available at More Beer. More Beer sells the highest standard in homebrewing equipment, and the Brewbuilt Conicals are just that. They're made from mere polished 304 stainless steel, and they come with loads of features that you and I have been looking for. They have a full 2-inch bottom dump valve, which will eliminate your clogging issues, while the sturdy base includes four reinforced legs, just like those big pro tanks do. More Beer also carries the Brewbuilt line of options and add ons like casters, pressure kits, and even external glycol chillers. So you can find out more about the new Brewbuilt X1 Conical Uni Tanks by going over to morebeer.com for detailed videos on the entire line of Brewbuilt Conicals. You can trust Brewbuilt with your next fermentation, and you can trust More Beer to find the right conical for you. Brewbuilt at morebeer.com. And welcome to the session. We are back in the studio once again, trying some new things for the first time since uh, since the pandemic, where, you know, during the pandemic, we, we had nobody in the studio ever except for me, which Zoom made uh, very simple. And, and then now uh, I switched back to nobody on Zoom ever because I wanted humans back in the studio. And then uh, my friend Jamil, who's with us today, uh, calls me up, sends me an email and says, I want to do a Zoom uh, interview where a bunch of us come in the studio and then somebody's not in the studio and then why don't you go ahead and figure that out and and that's where Zoom becomes difficult but I think I have us working today and ready for a fantastic show with Jamil's friend and hopefully soon to become the rest of our friend here on the Brewing Network George Tume and he's from uh, Demoschlutl George am I close yeah, I guess so. I mean, I don't really speak Dutch, but uh, that's as far as I will go, too. So it's the Moorschlotel uh, from uh, the Netherlands. Moorschlotel from the Netherlands. And, yes. uh, and, and so that kind of dives right into to why we're here today. Um, because Jamil and, and Jason went on um, what I'm going to call from now on Jamil and Jason's magic voyage. Uh <laughs> Where I, Funny, that's what we call them. Is that what you, <laughs> weird. <laughs> you did do? Yeah. Uh, I think Jason's maybe never been on such a voyage before. Uh, not a not, magic one. Not a magic one. No, okay. no, no. I haven't got to all those places. So I w- I've been through Germany and, and Czech Republic and England and whatnot. But we, we went up to the ne- Netherlands and then northern part of Germany, which I had never been to before. So Okay. Yeah. Got it. And Jamil, who's spoiled rotten, has done this trip like a hundred times at this point, I think. He's gone yeah, everywhere. Yes. And, and knows every brewer in the world, I think, now. Pretty much. And so, so you guys go on this trip, um, and, and as, as Jason mentioned, you end up in Germany, and, and we could talk about a few other places, but either the very first or one of the first places you end up is in the Netherlands? Yeah, we flew into uh, Amsterdam and um, got there and... Uh, first day was just settling in and then the second day uh, a friend of mine Aaron he's a uh, pilot for KLM he's a home brewer I've known him for a, a number of years and visit him a few times uh, he was like I want to take you to my favorite brewery in the world okay and so he set up uh, a time for us to come visit and uh, he rented a car drove us an hour <laughs> out to uh, he took the day off of work wow drove us out there and uh, yeah we had we had an awesome time Nice. So you end up at uh, Morschlüdel mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. for the first time, and you don't spend any time just out of curiosity. You don't even spend the night getting high in Amsterdam or anything. No, <laughs> we actually looked for some sort of edibles. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know they don't do edibles right there. They uh, oh. it's they're they're restricted to like just baked goods like brownies and cakes. Okay, and they're not allowed to do like any gummies or anything like that. And then they're not allowed to tell you how much THC is in anything. 
why? That's odd. Yeah, and that seems strange. It would seem to be the opposite is right. what it sh- than what it should be. Right, right. So yeah. you don't really know what you're getting. Okay. And then a lot of it seems kind of like floor sweepings after they've, you know... <laughs> Okay. Roll, roll a bunch of joints, and then uh, like you just went to the tourist spot, and then they just no, no. We, we actually hunted down the like what's supposed he, to be he the was best trying place. real hard. Okay, he really, really wanted to get the good stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, that just didn't happen. Had to go. Had to go old school. Okay. All, all alcohol. Okay. All alcohol. On this well, trip. interestingly enough, and we'll get into this as we dive into the beers. I mean, at at everything I've read on the cans uh, that you that you sent us, George, are between. Well, I guess I'll give you a little bit of range from three and a half percent all the way up to like sixteen percent. So who needs to get high when you're drinking sixteen percent beer? Right, right. right. Yeah, one can will do you. <laughs> okay, so to help get us started with with the experience, why don't we talk about the beer that's yeah. in our glass? Yeah. Um, so George, we decided to open um, Crank the Session Juice, uh, which is listed as an IPA, but also as, listed as an IPA at three and a half. Percent. Um, now the the um, the narcissist in me wants to think that this beer is named after my show, which is called the Session. Uh, tell me I'm right. <laughs> yeah, you are right. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you have some other beers in front of me that are like different variations of Crank the Session and Crank. So uh, do you wanted to start with the name for us, and then you can talk about the beer. Yeah, I mean we that's our car range IPA. It's uh, Crank the Juice. And uh, we have this thing of doing uh, iterations of uh, car range beers. And this one was brewed specifically for the Swedish market where they have uh, alcohol laws where to be sold on regular supermarkets, it needs to be 3.5% or below alcohol. So we had to tweak our uh, main recipe to make it sessionable to be uh, within the 3.5%. So there goes the name, the crank to session. Okay. Choose and it just a... Uh, the same recipe, so the same hops, same malt, just a little tweaks to make it to go a little below. Uh, well, the usual 5.5 up to 3.5 percent ABV. Got it. I think this is one of the best 3.5 percent IPAs I've ever had. It's fantastic. It's yeah. a lot of flavor. It's Thanks. wonderful, but right. without and having and a bunch. Some, of, it's a body too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not thin and bitter, which is what you can often end up with, especially if you, like you said, if you started with your regular version at like five and a half, mm-hmm. and that you're just accepting the challenge to get it down to this. I feel like often is where you end up with kind of a thin and and this is balanced. Yeah. 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 This is Thanks. totally That's balanced. A, it really means a lot because. I think it's actually even the same old bill as a 5.5. It was just the mash temperature adjusted to ferment a little less than normal. Hmm. And then um, it ended up a bit higher, like on the low force. So we had to dilute the beer a little bit. And hmm. that made the beer a bit thin. Mm-hmm. So we then did some uh, mineral corrections post, uh, well, pre-packaging on the bright, just to make sure it was right, with the right mouthfeel, right bitterness. And I think it turned out pretty uh, nice. It was a pretty well tweaked beer to get the 3.5% uh, rolling out in a pretty balanced way. Yeah. I think the Swedes are onto something because I could drink a few pints of this. I, uh, <laughs> that's what I'd be drinking tonight. Yeah. I had it on tap. I, I'd be like, <laughs> give me a couple of pints yeah, of that. The, it's the only beer that I actually uh, usually carry at my place. I mean, we brew a lot of high alcohol stuff. We'll get into that later, but. We don't brew a lot of uh, lower ABG beers, so I like to keep this one around because, you know, it's 3.5, it's sessionable, we can have a few pints yeah. and just enjoy life. Is it hard to sell, though, outside of the Swedish market? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, low ABG beers usually have this uh, bad reputation. Yeah, here they're too. They're thin, they're watery, and um, yeah, but I think it, when people try it, especially in bars, once you have the first class, you'll see the full potential of it and just yeah keep going back yeah we don't even go, not only get the thin and watery comments and beers but at at my bar we we also get the like well if i'm gonna spend seven dollars on a mm-hmm. pint you know i kind of wanted to have some alcohol in it right whereas i'm like uh if i'm gonna spend seven dollars on a pint i just i want to make sure it tastes good first like mm-hmm. i kind of don't care about the abv right. um unless i'm like being careful that it's got too much to be honest with you mm-hmm. not too low yeah, but yeah, yeah, you know, a lot of people they, you know, they they see you three and a half percent selling for the same price as a seven percent because the hops are all the same, the malts all the same, right? And you know, it costs the the production would cost the same, 
but they're just like, well, it should be half the price. <laughs> like, well, no, it's yeah, all no. the same ingredients, all the same, same labor. Yeah. You know, cost yeah, especially with an, an IPA <laughs> like this. I mean, you're going to add tons of hops and dry hopping in this. That's where your, that's that's where your, your expense is. Yeah. What other hops, George? Uh, Citra and uh, Mosaic. We just went uh, straight. I mean, it, we talked about that uh, when we uh, were there. It's the combination that doesn't feel always yeah. guaranteed success. That's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know brewers who refuse to make it. I any almost any beer without mosaic in it at all ever. <laughs> <laughs> that one, um, yeah, that's really nice. Excellent. Okay, so you guys end up at the brewery. Uh, you've never met them before, but right. your, your friend brings you there because it's yeah. one of his favorites. So kind of kind of walk me through that. Is it out in the middle of nowhere? Where do you end up? It's kind of like in an industrial place where it was like. We had a little trouble finding it at first. <laughs> and the door. We couldn't find the door. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he, we, uh, it was behind like a gas station, you know, like all the best breweries are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so we went back behind there, and then and then uh, he was having trouble finding the door. And I'm like, let's just walk in through the big open roll-up where, where the forklift is. He's like, no, nah, we don't want to do that. You know, we want to be polite. I'm like, eh, I just walk into all breweries that way. <laughs> right. So he called them and they're like, yeah, just walk in through the big roll up. There you go. And he did uh, put his pants back on first before he went in. That's so, fair. Yeah. I mean, it is another country and everything. But uh, yeah, uh, so they, they, they were very welcoming and uh, uh, place was, you know, uh, in every, every building and, and they're looking at moving to another building. Uh, but every building has its you know quirks as to how you fit everything in. So they did some. Very, you can tell there's a lot of engineering minds around there because hmm. they fit everything in. Everything was done just just uh, beautifully. I thought they they did a really good job. Is it just a production brewery or a tasting room too? What's the what's the what's the lay of the land, George? It's just a production facility. Okay. I guess uh, the laws here are not very easy to get uh, tasting rooms. Okay. On production facilities, especially because it's on the industrial area. So right now we can only have a production facility. Eventually in the future, as we're looking to move into our own building, uh, where this is just a leased space, we're looking to, towards a new facility, and then we'll try to get our tasting room there too. Do you have offsite tasting rooms, or are you just uh, production and it goes into offsite accounts? No, we have a tasting room uh, downtown where we're based in Alkmaar. Okay. That's interesting. So you can have a tasting room. You just can't have it at your brewery, your production yeah, facility. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. weird. Um, I guess every place has some weird laws, though. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So you go, and then uh, w- what do you find out that is kind of their, their specialty, Jamil, or do they have one? Yeah, it's, it's you know, from my view, it's mainly, you know, these you know, huge stouts that uh, are some barrel age, some non-barrel age with lots of uh, interesting flavors and ingredients. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, pretty pretty much when you say Jason, that was yeah, absolutely. And uh, he had us try so many beers, and they were right. all fantastic. <laughs> yeah, but right. man, after right. sampling, right? We I'm glad, I'm glad we here. had someone to drive us <laughs> out of there. Well, when yeah, I we, we got a little hammered, we we're going through the box of beers that you sent here, George, or sent with them. I should mention because they came in lugging this massive box that I then find out that you're their first stop. So they apparently lugged this box all around Europe, right? Together, the <laughs> fact is, that we didn't drink the whole thing before we got back. But I'm like, look, we'll we'll save it and we'll do a show. Yeah, you know, love it. Well, part of it, we were so beat up when we got back too. Both of us were like, yeah, we're not drinking for a little while. Okay. <laughs> I'll just put this in the fridge. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and so yeah, we're, we know we don't get a lot of visitors. So whenever they come by, I just give them beer just to make them uh, happy. So that's the least we can do. <laughs> you, you made us very happy. <laughs> you took you're, care of us for sure. Yeah. You, your hospitality was was wonderful. Well, and and we're going to get through some of these here shortly. But I just just as an example, because you're describing these kind of interesting beers that you make, I'm holding a uh, brunch blanche in front of me, which is an oat milk breakfast white stout. That we're going to try. Um, we've got a freeze distilled red velvet stout that we're going to try. We've got a rye wine we're going to try. Um, so you guys do really like to make uh, interesting non-traditional beers, it seems. Yeah, so it all started with four brothers. They, uh, Their dad, he had a small uh, brewing kit, and uh, they found it was funny. They started making beers. And at the point, they were having a lot of uh, imperial stouts mostly American uh, breweries, and they thought that was funny, so they kept on doing those beers. 
and they made a name on making big beers. So that's, uh, I guess, where we stand right now, just making big beers. Okay. But then from stouts, we try to make some uh, variations on doing adjuncts, other flavors, spices, then uh, rye wines and barley wines as well, just to keep things interesting. But that's uh, where we focus just very out there and extreme beers in general. Is that Does that have anything to do with the market that you're in, or are you guys very unique in, in your market too? Well, there's a demand for uh, very uh, expressive beers around here. That's what I feel. Uh, at least the Netherlands seems to be a country where people really seek the great stuff, you know, like great beers, high alcohol, barrel-aged beers. Yeah. And there's a huge demand for that kind of stuff. Okay. Are there a lot of craft breweries in the country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, uh, it's insane. I'd say about 900 breweries in a country with 14 million people. So it's... Uh, yeah. It's quite a lot. That is quite a lot, yeah. And how long have you been there? Where are you from, George? I'm uh, from Portugal. Okay. Uh, I've been here for two years. I uh, just joined the team when they were uh, scaling up production, so I was like the second employee on the team, wow. and now we're twenty over 25 people. Wow. So they they just made a commitment that they were growing, so that was a lot of investment was going on at the time on equipment, facility, and all that. So they needed people, and I joined the team as the, well, just a brewer back then, now as the ad brewer, yeah. and I uh, just came to take the role on helping them to scale up. Were you brewing professionally in Portugal before that? Uh, no, I was working at the brewery, but uh, I was just operations management there. I started at the tap room, then worked my way up to operations management, just uh, kind of tying up the not between the sales and G6 and production, just making sure the daily operation was going smooth. Okay. But I wanted to gig on brewing, so I just moved in uh, for a nice challenge. Was it just, did you just find an ad that they were looking for a brewer, or how'd you get connected? Yeah, they were actually uh, seeking two people, so I moved with a former colleague also from Portugal, and uh, they were asking for two brewers, and we applied together. And that's kind of a fun story. I mean, we did the interview together. Uh, for the job that was uh, pretty funny. That is and funny. We moved, and we moved together, and that was uh, well. That made things easier than just moving along. A brewing duo. That's, that's it's like Step Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like sorry, we're just kind of a package deal here. You got We're both moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's how we framed the thing. Like we sent the application. We're like, hey, you either get both or you get none. So <laughs> let's talk and see if that works out. <laughs> that's great. And I love just. I still would have interviewed you separately. I don't know why. It just seems like the right thing to do. I think that's hilarious that they, they interviewed you together. Uh, did you answer each other's questions, or did you? Did you, did you no, just... it, it, it was like two interviews separated, but we were just sitting next to each other. Mm-hmm. It was funny. I mean, it's important to know that uh, it's a pretty young company. So the four brothers, the oldest, is like thirty-two years old. So it's a pretty young company. Okay, uh, young as the people, not only the company, but the people behind the company. They're pretty young. So I think that laid-back posture also helps to get these. Uh, nice opportunities of communication and engagement. Sure. And how different is the Netherlands uh, as a lifestyle or culture uh, to, to Portugal for you? Yeah, it's completely different. I mean, Portugal has no beer culture. So, All right. I mean, in 2009, there were seven breweries registered in the country. Now there's over 100. So okay. it's not even 10 years of uh, growing things uh, there. So there's no tradition. It's a wine country. So it takes time for people to get used to it. And Netherlands, it's a much more established market with a bigger culture, years of a drinking culture. So it's a night and day in terms of the sales volume, demand for the market and all that. So it was just a scale up in terms of the demand. Okay. All right, well, why don't we do this? Let's take a quick break so that we can get some different and more beer into our glass. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. I want to thank our sponsor today real quick, More Beer. They sponsor this show and every session that we do. Check out Free Beer Fridays on their YouTube channel. Just check out More Beer over on YouTube. And Chris Graham gives stuff away every single Friday over there. So go check them out and thank them for being a sponsor of our show. You're listening to The Session. I'm your host, Justin Crosley, and we will be right back. Welcome back to the session. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, we are still hanging out with Morschleudel. 
I'm going to probably say it, say it different every time I do it, but uh, for, they're from the Netherlands, and George is joining us today to share some of the, the wonderful beer that he sent home with Jamil and Jason. You guys lugged yep. all over all over Europe. We took that that <laughs> case of beer by we Amsterdam. <laughs> oh, I took it at first. Yeah, at first, and then it ended and up then, in my suitcase. Well, right, because <laughs> like then the whole trip. Because then I started picking up other stuff. Oh, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah. You carry this heavy beer. Right. Well, I bought some T-shirts. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. you see. You That's said, what happened. You said, "Oh, I got room for it." When when we first got it, I didn't you think got, you were going to bite. It. Come on, I'm like, uh, at that I'm point, like, he was still thankful that he was on this trip with you. Right, right. Four right. days later, and I've been on those trips with you, Jamel. Four days later, it's <laughs> like, like, "Fuck this guy! You carry it. <laughs> carry my suitcase while you're at it." Will you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, where else did you? What can I get a brief uh, country list that you guys uh, we, joined? Well, we went from there right. to uh, Dusseldorf, nice, and then we did a little side trip to Cologne, and then Bromberg and uh, Munich, okay, and then back. Nice. That's a, that's a nice trip. Did yeah. you fly all around or? Uh, no, tra- train. Train, okay. Uh, Dusseldorf was actually pretty spectacular. We staggered into at Schumacher. We were just got there, hadn't eaten all day, we're starving. I'm like, well, Schumacher is really close to the hotel. Let's just walk there, get something to eat. We get there, giant crowd all out in the street, filling the sidewalk. I'm like, damn, wow. it's so busy, we're not going to get in. The guy at the door, he's like, well, did you want to eat? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, come on in. It turns out it was their Lotsen beer day. I they don't do know. It it, it, one they only day, do it twice a year. Like three, a, three days a year. They okay. do it, they three, do it oh. on. They do it uh, in March. It's a Thursday in March, a Thursday in June, and a Thursday in September. Okay. We were there on that Thursday in September just by dumb luck. Yeah. And got their, you know, their beer, that their special beer that they make. And uh, it was it was delicious, and the food, uh, it was one of the greatest meals I've ever had in my life. Oh. It was tremendous. It was pork knuckle, oh, and gosh, it was it. done spectacularly. Slow it was roasted, then deep just, fried. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. Incredible. And we had other pork knuckles on the trip, but that one was by far the best. Uh, we had so many pork knuckles that. Uh, Jason said he had to go to the bathroom. And <laughs> oh, I, came up, I came up with the I came up with the phrase. Oh, time to knuckle down. <laughs> oh, no. so we started using the phrase. It's time to knuckle down. Yeah, uh, I need to knuckle down. It does tend to move through you a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Probably so. my favorite German dish, though. That's awesome. Oh, and yeah. at this place, it was absolutely the best. And what was what was this style of beer? It was it was like it's they're just like beer. a bigger it's version, okay. right? Five like and a half percent yeah. instead of four six. <clears throat> Okay. A hoppier, more bitter. Really flavorful. Yeah. Really oh, good. Tremendous. And we should have bought some bottles, but we didn't. We talked well, about it. Well, that's what I said. Let's buy some bottles. Or that would have been in my he, suitcase, too. Right? He's like, <laughs> yeah. uh, I've been lugging those as he's well. He's like, yeah. we'll, we'll pass by again, and we'll, we'll pick them up then. I don't want to lug them around. I'm like, well, yeah, they may not be here. Mm. So we didn't get any. Okay. Well, but hey, we we got to drink that. Yeah, I'm happy beer. for you. Pretty awesome. <laughs> so the rest of you guys, maybe not so much. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, before we talk more about the brewery itself, the beer that is now in our glass is Brunch Blanche, uh, which is described as an oatmeal breakfast white stout. It's a 9% beer. Um, color-wise, and if I ever end up putting this uh, video up on YouTube, uh, it's a yellow stout. Talk, uh, talk to us about this beer, George. Yeah, so that was a bit of a pet peeve to me, making a white stout for a long time was one of the styles that I said I would never brew, but uh, I usually take these uh, collab beers. It's a collaboration with the Portuguese brewery. They were in town, Letra. Uh, they were in town, and uh, I usually get these collab beers to be a bit out there, just to be out of our ordinary role of IPAs and stouts and barley wine. So I try to do something different with these beers. And uh, we have been discussing in a funny way to make a white stout for a few months then. And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's uh, do it, see how it comes out of there. The name of the style, it's a bit out there. The breakfast, oat milk, uh, white stout comes uh, with that. And it was just an idea to get a, a cold and colored white stout, like a properly cold and colored white stout, where the rose flavor comes from chocolate and coffee edition, uh, a bit of vanilla too. So trying to mimic the style where something you'd picture as a stout if you were drinking from a mm-hmm. paper cup, something like that. I think it's not quite interesting. It's uh, something special yeah, uh, on its own. Probably not the most sessionable beer uh, we've ever 
rude, but uh, mm-hmm. I like the challenge in, the, in that sense. And I love the idea of, well, you're not really tricking people, but I, I never like the statement from, from either new beer drinkers or people who think they don't like beer when they just say, oh, I, don't, I don't like dark beers. Right. They're too heavy. And too yeah, much alcohol. And I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. Then you know what? I'm going to give you something that's not a stout at all. Put it mm-hmm. in front of them. And just by color, they'll go, oh, wonderful. And then they'll taste it. They'll go, wonderful. And then I'll basically <laughs> say, there's nothing about that that isn't a dark beer except the color. <laughs> all of the other things. Uh, which actually is a question I have for both you, Jamil, and, and George. Does anything go missing from a stout when it becomes a white stout? In other words, do you do you really need it those dark roasts to do something different? Is there just some little thing missing? Well, you know, the amount of roast character you can get is becomes limited. Okay, if you really want, you know, some intense roastiness. Mm-hmm. I think that that becomes very difficult to achieve. Okay, but there's plenty of dark beers where even the dark malt you're not quite going for roast either. True, right? Okay. Like a, a carafa special or something like that where it's a uh, huskless uh, mid- midnight wheat or uh, whatever. You know, all those uh, don't contribute very much roastiness but contribute color. Okay. What do you think, George? Did you, you know, describe the challenge to you too? Yeah, I think if I were to brew this beer again, I would include a little bit of peated malt just to mimic the roastiness aspect, which I think it misses from that beer, but to keep the color light. But I think it's a style of itself. Uh, people tend to call it white stout, but yeah, I would just scrape the stout out of there. It's just a gold nail with a coffee and a chocolate, and it works pretty well. It creates a flavor of its own. The stout, I think it's more of a gimmick to play around. But yeah, stout is a thing. A white stout is a different style completely. Okay. That's a that's an interesting thought, the peated malt, because one, I hate peated malt, but uh, two, um, you know, I've always said, you know, the, the thing about peated malt is it's, you know, phenolic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's got those phenols. But so do uh, dark roasted grains. There are phenols that are part of the, the roast. Okay. And, yeah, I wonder if you used a really tiny amount of peated malt, if that would kind of give the impression. I think that's a really fascinating uh, idea. Mm-hmm. Have you tried that before, George? Yeah, I made one back in Portugal while I'm brewing, uh, doing a bit of peated malt. I, uh-huh. at some point, meant to include that in, in this beer, Chris. I don't know why I did it, but it okay. never ended up in there. Uh, it's fascinating. I've, I don't think I've ever tried that. Now, now uh, George is also working on a book where he reveals a lot of his secrets of uh, really? flavors and adjuncts and things like that. So. I don't know when yeah. that's coming out, but uh, some someday well, in the future. Well, hopefully, hopefully this year. Let's see if uh, that uh, works out. Is well, that like now a, you're on the hook to get it done? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, now we've put it out there for you. So, um, yeah. who's the market for that? Is that pro brewers, home brewers? Do you care? Just curious. I'd say mostly home brewers and yeah. uh, some pro brewers. There's a bit of a kind of a wide knowledge there, or like secrets or tips, ideas. Like a broadening a bit of uh, your school of thought, just to be more uh, broad in the way you think beer. Okay. Like these things of uh, incorporating peated malt in a white stout, that kind of uh, thoughts about beer. Okay, got it. Yeah. So to me, this you know, if you did blind tasting of this beer and some some dark stouts in front of mm-hmm. me, I wouldn't be able to go, oh yeah, that's the white one, that's the dark one, blind. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Same with like, there's another brewery out here who makes one uh, faction, uh, and there's is called Anomaly. And he uh, made it as a joke to start and, and promised he'd never make it again. And then it became like their second most popular beer ever. And so his wife makes him brew it in constant rotation. Now. <laughs> and he, I think he still hates that he has to brew it. But it was so good. And so I feel perfectly done. Like if you did it blind, no one's ever going to tell you it's a white stout. Um, Roger, I, Roger's a great brewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just won a couple medals at uh, GABF this year, as a matter of fact, too. Um, all right. Well, so tell me a little bit more about the the brewery uh, experience. I, I, anything unique that you found there, Jamil? I know you guys manufacture your own equipment uh, in some ways too. But uh, right, I, I, you know, for me that's a that's a difficult question because what I kind of keyed in on was the fact that yeah, a lot of places there was, and I think George said something about 
yeah, if they need something welded or something built, they just tell them they need something built, and they come in, and a welder shows up with a bunch of stainless and starts right tacking stuff there. together. Yeah. So it, it, you could tell that that was the case. They had access to that kind of uh, you know personnel and technology. So instead of I having to it, wait months and order things, right, and, or just order something stock or mm-hmm. building things out of wood instead of stainless. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, I, th- I think that's what really was the thing that I keyed on. How about you, Jason? Yeah, I mean, really well put together. You could tell that they designed this place and, and they added to it almost Winchester Mystery House kind of style where they mm-hmm. put, they put this, added this, added that, but it all made sense. Mm-hmm. And based off of probably what George said he needed. Right. And they're using all this equipment really, really well, and he's super knowledgeable. And so, yeah, you could tell in the product. It's fantastic. So let's get to the bottom of that, George. It's it, the your, your founders are also engineers to start? Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole family, I mean, the four brothers, they're all engineers. Their dad's an engineer working with uh, welding, there you go, for uh, over 40 years now. So, yeah, it's an engineering-based company. And actually, they branched out from the brewing side to actually have uh, their own engineering company building some uh, packaging solutions for uh, small size brewers uh, like we are. And that's uh, pretty nice because we can prototype equipment internally and then just sell that to other breweries that have the same needs we have. Um, And yeah, it comes really handy to have that knowledge in-house and solving some of those problems where you need a part welded, you need to find, figure out a solution for a problem and they just step in and things just work super fast in that regard. Yeah, brewery slash engineering shop. That's kind of a dream come true for most <laughs> brewers, especially for you, George. I, it might be a pain in the ass for them, but George is like, yep, need this and I want it tomorrow, please. <laughs> That'd be yeah. nice. That's, that's pretty much how it works. Yeah. That would be so nice. <laughs> right. Yeah. I have to call the, the guys over at Heretic that I know. I'm like, hey, can well, you come over and help me? F- if Jesse can't fix it. <laughs> right. Th- th- maybe I can get somebody to when come the, over and weld the, something for when me. When the beer turns out this great, I don't think they mind. Whatever George wants, George gets. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. All right. We just poured ourselves uh, Willy Tonka, George. Uh, described here as a... as has tonka, uh, coconut, and white chocolate, imperial stout. And you want to guess the ABV? You just took a sip, Jay-Z. I know that's a tough game to play, but why not? It's tucked in there well. I know that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, great I'd coconut go, in the nose. Go maybe 12, 13? Nailed it. 12% alcohol right there. Yeah. Um, tell us about this beer, George. Yeah, so that's part of a series we uh, brew, Willy Tonka. So it's just an imperial stout, always with the Tonka beans added to it. And then we go through iterations. That one, um, yeah, coconut and white chocolate added to it. Here comes the engineering part. So we have this Ishan tank. We used to do the adjuncts. And we have a tiny one that could take, I don't know, like 50, 60 kilos of coconut flakes in. Um, and uh, we needed one bigger. So we just uh, got a yeast tank, welded some parts into that, got a trainer <laughs> here and there, and now I can take four times as more wow. uh, coconut flakes inside. So that was actually the first time we did coconut in there. And uh, it was so full that the top of the coconut didn't even get soaked, soaked in beer <laughs> because it was just, yeah, just completely packed uh, with the uh, adjuncts. So what is a tonka bean? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's weird. I guess it's uh, kind of not legal in the U.S., so you don't see that a lot, at least commercially in mm. the U.S., I guess. It's a, kind of a vanilla bean mixed with a cinnamon <coughs> steak, in a way. Interesting. If I had to translate that into things, hmm. other things. That's another and, delicious uh, beer. Yeah. super flavorful. It's... Mm-hmm. Um, Quite creamy in a way, not as sweet as vanilla, and not as spicy as uh, cinnamon. As a really a flavor profile of its own, but mm-hmm. it pairs super well with the stouts. So this falls into the pastry stout category, right? Kind of, you know that that sort of general term that we use out here. Mm, yeah, sure. I, yeah, in the neighborhood, you got some residual sweetness in there, and it's yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Is there lactose in this? No, there's no lactose okay. or maltodextrin or any other unfermentable sugar. That's just malt. 
So some beers we do use either lactose or maltodextrin, but not that often. Hmm. It depends on the type of beer we're uh, brewing. But that one's just a malt all throughout, just the way we brew it to keep a bit on the sweet side. And I guess the adjunct with chocolate and tonka and the coconut just brings some of the creaminess out that gets you perceived sweetness. I see. Well, I only bring that up because I'm trying to figure out a category so that I can make the statement, it is one of the best I've ever had in this category. <laughs> yeah. But I needed to find a category to say it because it's like I could just say Imperial Stout. It's actually also one of the best Imperial Stouts I've ever had. Just What what, what uh, ma- what's the highest mash temperature you use? You mentioned uh, high mash temp on the, the session uh, IPA. That one I'd say like 73C. Um, so I can get a calculator. Yes, quick, let's all do Fahrenheit math. 163.4. Yeah, Jamil does it. Yeah. Wow. Um, That's his phone. He's, <laughs> don't believe anything. You do. <laughs> don't ruin the mystique. Oh, sorry. Yeah, don't, <laughs> I, I, I let you look I, behind I, the I curtain here for a second. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, uh, and is that the highest mash temp you've, you've used? Yeah, that's for us, wow. the session IPA, that's uh, I... Uh, for styles a little bit lower, but I guess just uh, saturating a lot with the uh, malt and uh, mashing mm-hmm. in super thick um, at a pretty uh, low ratio of water to grain that gets the well perceived sweetness and mm-hmm. a bit of short uh, mash rest as well helps to keep beta glucans and proteins in there to keep the mouth feel as full as the, the beer gets. Yeah, uh, back when I first started homebrewing, uh, somebody told me that um, Lagunitas used uh, 74C on their IPA, hmm. which I was like, no, that can't be. <laughs> yeah. Somebody's lying to me, but <clears throat> I don't know. And then I've, I've done beers at mash temperatures that high, and it works. Um what was the uh, the starting and finishing gravity on this beer? Do you you know off the top of your head? Uh, that one should be about thirty two platos, mm-hmm. which uh, times four, whatever that gets you. Right. And finishing gravity should be around thirteen platos. Thirteen. Yeah. My memory serves me right. Yeah. Right. Some of the actual right. pastry styles where we uh, use unfermentable sugar, they go a bit higher, maybe seventeen, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't taste as sweet as a as a thirteen Plato beer. No, it's not I, cloying I think, at all. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think you know some of the other uh, additions, um, maybe the Tonka bean and other stuff is it kind of in the roast has helped giving it that balance that 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 dryness. Well, that's one of the things that I noticed when we were there, and and now again, his use of adjuncts. Mm-hmm. In relation to his recipe, is he, he stands out? I mean, yeah. This is unique, unusual, right? Right, really good. Well, they're all really well balanced. <clears throat> I think that's that's the thing. Anybody can throw in a bunch of crap, and so and often they do, do. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then yeah, it ends up not balanced. Didn't you have right. a, you had a beer called that right? Throwing a bunch of crap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. No, you're right. It has a, a just an, an awesome balance. Uh, I'm curious. Do you know why the the tonka bean would would be illegal in the U.S.? What drug is it used in? Tell me what else tonka beans are used for, George. <laughs> I think there's kind of a cumeric acid in it, and uh, that goes beyond the threshold that's legally to be consumed. Something like that. Oh, I see. That's why you cannot use it. So you could actually, it can be harmful if you have. So this beer will kill us is too what much saying. of it. Yeah. <laughs> you shortened my yeah. life. Oh, wait, this is why he had me carry the suitcase, <laughs> right? right? In case right. You I was it. smuggling beer in. Right. I had no, no idea. Yeah. You're smuggling the tonka. You, you guys are safe. I've had, I've had enough of those, and uh, it's fine. And you're fine. <laughs> it's all right. I thought we were about to find out what George really feels about you. He's like, <laughs> by the way, in yeah. about 30 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Without <laughs> the antidote, yeah. you're doomed. Right. Yeah. By the by, the end of the show. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. There's you another can... beer we have to drink to counteract this. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. A new, yeah. Figure out which one it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah this is just a, a, a great beer. Um, and then uh, and and white chocolate. Um, in in what form are you getting chocolate in the beer? How, how do you add that? Yeah, we use the cocoa butter in there, and um, I guess paired with the coconut just mimics a bit of the white chocolate uh, aspect of it. 
I see. Oh, yeah. And we also use the uh, cocoa leaves uh, on their own, so as a bit of both. But the best term we found to describe it was white chocolate, right? Because of the creaminess of the coconut and the beer, would just make sense to call it white chocolate. Sure, I do enjoy coconut and beer. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. In the early days of craft brewers, or at least my tasting them, they weren't as good at them. So mm-hmm. the first time I had one, that I it was probably right. like Maui Brewing or something, mm-hmm. and I had to go, all right, what did you do? Because every other coconut beer I've had was shit mm-hmm. compared to yours. And he was he was roasting his own coconut was his real his main answer. Um, I roast think now your own nuts. You gotta <laughs> roast your own. You gotta nuts. roast your own. Even it, even with his big brewery now, he bought a bunch of ovens to mm-hmm. keep roasting coconut. Um, but I think brewers in general have just gotten so much better at it now that right. most coconut beers I think taste mm-hmm. great. They but, have to roast it. Um, but this is just a nice combination, and I do pick up the cinnamon too from the Tonka. I don't right. know that I would have pointed it out to you until you said it, George. But then, yeah, there's just that little bit. Uh, I think that's adding of kind a, of a spiciness to yeah, it. Yeah, a little spicy kind of bite, a little heat. Yeah, tiny bit. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, not really cinnamon, but something very akin to cinnamon. Yeah, yeah, I like that. All right. Well, we've got more beer to get through, so I'm going to have us take a quick break uh, so we can handle that and get some more uh, of these wonderful beers. I think the, I don't know if the ABV keeps going up, but we're staying right around this plane from here on out, boys. So, you know, <laughs> sip slowly. We've got a little more show left to do. Hang in there. You're listening to the session, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the session. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we are still here uh, with George from Moore Schlüdel, uh out of the Netherlands, and we're trying all sorts of good beer from him. Um, very good beer. Let me just rephrase that, George, because it's just tasting awesome. I just shared some with my customers out there, and as I and I left them alone for a minute, and as I was walking back by, I hear them murmuring how fantastic it is too. So, a little bonus for if you come hang out at the Hop Grenade when we do shows like this, you get beers you'd never get to try before. I, I wouldn't bring you crap. Nope, nope, you don't. <laughs> you brought me in here though. Last yeah. Time. Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was one, that one time? Once in fifteen years, yeah, it's yeah. not so bad. <laughs> you know, so you're not bad in a thousand. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this before we dive into the next beer. I am noticing on many of your labels uh, actual photographs of people on on them, not just drawings, not cartoons, but but photographs of people. What's that? What's that about? Yeah. So that. That would make more sense if you had the whole set, but um, ah. we do this uh, pack every year for the anniversary, uh, well, beer pack. And uh, since it's our sixth anniversary, we were trying to think of teams that would pair with six. And I sold them the idea that four brothers, mom and dad, since they all work at the brewery, that would be the ideal. Yeah. So we just made the beer for each one of the family members. And at first it was just a caricature or something like that of each one of the family members, but we ended up just coming straight with the photos. Yeah. So each of the family members got their own photograph based label and a beer to represent whatever they wanted to drink or like. So they have all a little story behind that why it was brewed like that. Nice. So I, now if it was my photo, I would hate your idea, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, as a consumer, I think it's awesome to go with the real photo. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, years ago, it might have just looked like bad art, a little cheesy or something. But it, nowadays, it totally fits. It's a little retro. And I love that I'm actually just looking at the face of somebody from the family on the can. I think it's cool. The one we have in our glass now, uh, and I guess it's called, you said, the, the Six Years series, which is for the sixth anniversary. Um, the rye wine in our glass has Tom on there so who's is tom's one of the brothers i assume yeah 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 he's uh, one of the brothers at the engineering side so they divide two brothers take care of the brewing side two brothers take care of the engineering side okay nice okay and so this is a 10 percent beer and maybe can we start simple can you just explain to me what a rye wine I- even is well it's a barley wine with a tons of rye instead of barley into the mix okay uh, to get more of the spicy character of rye there I see. And does this wine part have to do with ABV, Jay-Z, from a style perspective? Generally, yeah. Same with barley wine, rye yeah, wine. Okay. Right. Got it. Um, but now they're lower ABV than some of the other beers we're making, you know. Right. Yeah. Well, the, even this one at 10%, right? Is that what I, is that what I said? Right. Was? That, would be yeah. a, that would be a barley wine, barley, rye yeah. wine type of thing. Where Right in there. But, you know, before I left Heretic, we brewed a 18.5% IPA. 
Okay. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a single IPA at 18.5%? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Of course you did. Easy drinker. I feel like that was just your middle finger of you, as you were leaving. That's what he did to us. He brought it over in a growler and he's like, hey, you guys want to try this? And we're like, cool. It's an IPA. And the next thing I know, I'm like, what the hell? Right. <laughs> well, tell me more about the beer. Uh, wh- what is the, the malt bill? Ish. It's uh, just a bunch of rye. We have used some uh, UK specialty rye malts from the Simpsons uh, malts. And it was a little... A uh, funny story because Tom usually carries around a bottle of uh, rye whiskey every now and then. And that led to a conversation about rye whiskey, rye wine. And, uh, we were using a lot of rye in our stouts. And uh, there was a challenge of making the rye wine. So we got these uh, red rye gristle. It's basically a special bean from an uh, English uh, maltzer. Okay. And uh, we tried to make a rye wine. Boiled it for about six hours in total. Uh, oh. I think it turned out pretty uh nice wow yeah did you have trouble mashing what percentage of rye did you end up using it's it's quite got a nice viscous <laughs> mm-hmm. you know yeah i think it was about 30 percent rye in total uh but having the mash filter the boiler mash filter that really helps a lot with uh, using these hot grains mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. it just others kind of easy in the automation way for you so yeah it's difficult, but not as much as if it was a Walter ten. Right. With the mash filter, you just squeeze yeah. the, the daylights out of it. And Would that be the mash filter that you just had Tom build for you for this beer? <laughs> or would that come with your brew system? <laughs> no, that, that, that came with a... Uh, okay. That came made out elsewhere. Okay, yeah. got it. <laughs> but the programming was uh, done, in, which is uh, funny as well. So There we go. It's got a, a very kind of a deep red color mm-hmm. to it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, uh, definitely some sweetness uh, mm-hmm. and and a little residual, like on the lips. You know, there's a, a kind of a little stickiness there. Um, the I feel like rye can have a, especially that, that much of it can get that the spice can get a little gnarly. But I think the sweetness on this one kind of covers that. Right, um, balances it out. Yeah, again with the with a the of, balance, a of, nice balance. Yeah. Yeah, and is it just two row then? The the rest of it's two row, and then um, and then rye malt. Yeah, it's a different kinds of rye malt. So it has okay. a toasted rye, it has a, that red rye crystal rye malt. So there's layers of rye malt in there to make the flavor a bit more complex and uh, boil for a long time as well to keep the sweetness a bit high to balance out the spiciness from the rye. Okay, uh, but I guess to make it more of a fortified wine experience, hence the name, rye wine. So that's why the sweetness also plays a role in there. And then we use some uh, hefty amount of uh, American hops to get some uh, fruitiness to also balance it out a little bit. All right. That's, uh, that was my next question, is if hop variety even matters on this or if you're looking for IBU, but you, you just said you're looking for some fruitiness. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we use a, a Chinook uh, in that one and Columbus. And we fermented with an English uh, strain to get some of the esters uh, to pair up with the spiciness from the, the rye. Okay. Now, do you do uh, a fair amount of correction, you know, post-ferment? Let's say, you know, especially like the first time you've brewed a beer, you've got it in the tank. Do you find yourself, you mentioned making a correction on, uh, I think, the the session beer. <clears throat> do you find yourself making corrections on, on some of these uh you know, uh, other beers with all these different flavors sometimes. What I always found myself doing was, you know, we made a beer called Goo, and it it had, you know, um, toasted coconut and chocolate and vanilla and, you know, uh, bourbon and uh, bourbon barrel-aged. And and I I felt like, okay, you know, vanilla's not coming through enough. We need to goose the vanilla a little bit. And, you know, we we did a lot of in-tank adjustments to get it just right before we released it. Do you find yourself doing that? Because when you deal with all these flavors, it seems like you would you would need to, you know, either you're getting really lucky or you're making some adjustments. Yeah. No, we make a lot of adjustments. I would say like 50% are sure bets where we have some prior experience where we kind of nail things down on the first try. Mm. This one, the right wine was actually, we were pretty lucky, I guess, because it turned out great on the first try. But the brunch plunge we had, uh, you guys were having earlier, that one was tweaked 
just before packaging with some uh, sodium bicarbonate to bring up more of the chalkiness of the stout because it was brewed as a IPA pretty much because the rice was an IPA. But since we used some uh, lactic acid and phosphoric acid throughout the process, it was not drinking as a stout. And uh, then we did some trials and the sodium bicarb just got that round flavor from the bicarbonate and sodium as well. And it just was then drinking like a stout. So right before beers uh, are packaged, we <coughs> sample them all and we sign them off for packaging. If they're not as we wanted them to be, we take a few more days to try and find the solution hmm. for each beer to make it, you know, as we want them to be. Now, where did you learn all of your, where did you gain all of your knowledge about, you know, how to adjust beers and, you know, using sodium bicarbonate to make this adjustment or all the other things that, that, that you clearly you have a uh, that's coming great in the book. knowledge and yeah yeah i'm like if you didn't want to buy george's forthcoming book before that answer he just right. gave you do now <laughs> right right there you go. so that's a great question jibo how do you how did you find this stuff out it was just trial and error you know like having a beer from the bright and saying this is not right we could do better and then thinking what could make the beer better and then getting a bit of powder putting it in the glass swirling mm. ah, this tastes better and then you actually do a proper trial where you get a certain amount of beer, do a calculated amount of addition, try to calculate how much you need to add, and then add it to the beer and see how it turns out. But it's just uh, tasting the beers. And uh, I think being a brewer allows you to be in constant contact with the beer and how the beer develops from the moment you brew the wort all the way. Mm-hmm. But there is some backwards engineering and there. So the beer behaves and transforms. Yeah, a little bit, I guess. Because with, with that specific example, you might have gone, okay, so what makes a stout, right? Or that, like if it was just a stout, uh, mm-hmm. the water where they made stouts to begin with would have been high mm-hmm. in, in this bicarbonate, right? So in some ways, you're taking your knowledge of, of beer styles, of classic beers, to to remedy your, your modern beers. Yeah, absolutely. You just know a few pointers and you use those pointers to try to guide you to a, a certain direction. Yeah. I mean, it's something we've done before. It's something we've tried before. So we have this uh, encyclopedia of uh, things we can do to beers when uh, they're not as we want them to be. So, And mo- the more we try on them, the more, the easier it gets to adjust them I see. before being packaged. Yeah. I guess my question is, how did you gain that encyclopedic knowledge of of brewing yeah did you go to you know brewing school or Hmm. what did what did you study well uh, i think it's just a generic interest on uh, food and beverage just uh cuisine cooking getting a lot with uh other than just brewers getting along with the winemakers the stealers getting a lot of uh, perception from other school of thoughts getting with cooks and learning how the other people think about products in general Mm -hmm. and trying to apply that into beer so it's not only beer knowledge it's just food and beverage knowledge and trying to apply that to to beer yeah i did go to brain school or kind of still going but it's just collecting bits of knowledge here and there and trying to make my own puzzle i guess and the answer i was looking for was you listen to the jamel show (laughs) i know exactly (laughs) what i was looking for yeah (laughs) but george is too smart to fall into that trap that's right (laughs) Hey, for what it's so worth, you, you, I saw I, your I book on the show. You guys, I've, I've, uh, I've listened to hours and hours of podcasts from you guys, so uh, that comes without saying. So. <laughs> right, right. And still, by the way, a great question. And I was not even trying to simplify it too much by saying, oh, know about where Stout came from. Mm-hmm. I, I more was saying, yeah, once you sort of have this established encyclopedia of knowledge, to really sit down and think about it and apply it is, uh, is just something that not all brewers do. Um, but then again, not all brewers are, are brewing such complex beers, too. Right, right. So He's in a great position, too, where they allow him to create. Right. Yeah. So he has a certain kind of beer style and certain flavors. And he knows what sells and he knows what he can make and he knows how to use these ingredients. And he's putting them together really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that was a great beer. All right. Well I finished my glass of Tom. I finished my glasses all of these. You did you have every single <laughs> he's one. Not yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Um 
Okay, and now we've just poured for ourselves, George. Uh, also in the Six Years uh, series, uh, this one is called Marguerite, I think it's pronounced. Yeah. Uh, and it's a freeze-distilled red velvet stout. Who's Marguerite? Um Mother of the, the four brothers. Okay, wonderful. Also with a picture on the can of her holding a birth cake, a birthday cake, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and okay, and then this one is our, I guess, the biggest one we've had in the list so far. Sixteen percent. Um, That's an easy drink in sixteen. <laughs> I'm is. not trying to try. Is it really? I mean, they all are, but yeah. Um, so you wh- won't you won't even notice it. Is is freeze distilled? Is that the same as like a, a ice box, George? Is yeah, yeah, that's an ice box. Okay, it's the same. Yeah. Um, okay, and then what makes it a red velvet stout in this case? Well, red velvet is just a, kind of a name because red velvet doesn't even have raspberries or sour cherries in it, but it's red and has chocolate, so that's the thing. Okay, this beer has a raspberry, sour cherry, and chocolate added to it. Oh wow, um, that makes the red. Out of the velvet thing, really I guess. Good. And the, and the base of it was just a stout or an imperial stout. Like yeah, the, it was an imperial stout uh, brewed to eleven percent ABV. Okay, and it was freeze distilled to roughly seventeen percent ABV, and then we added fruit to it. At that point, there's no more yeast in there, no activity, no nothing. So we could add fruit with the residual sugar to it without the worry of re-fermenting at any point. Okay. So we just added the fruit before packaging to retain the juiciness from the fruit into the beer. I see. Wow. It's, so much going on. It's amazing. Now, okay, there's <laughs> not no heat. Like the, I, uh, I, yes. I'm not saying I'm, I, I'd go, oh, 16%, but right. going down. There's some warmth. And I like it. By the way, I, th- I want it there because you like uh, it going down. It's got a, it's got enough sweetness that it needs to be cut up a little bit. I, yeah. f- I feel like uh-huh. um, so. It's not not there. Go ahead, Jason. It, that aroma of like fresh raspberry really mm. really comes through too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's so much to talk about. There, it does taste. Uh, it's got some chocolate going on. The raspberry is is fresh and bright. Um, there's, I think, a lot of sweetness, but then the the alcohol cuts through that and the raspberry, yeah, the fruit, mm-hmm. yeah. acidity, tart of the fruit. cherries. You said too, yeah, mm, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, we also used sour cherries to kind of balance that out. We added some white oak, some American oak, to make the tannins a bit more pronounced to round up the edges with the alcohol and the sweetness to make it more balanced. And uh, maybe a touch of vanilla went in there too, just to get the cake uh, profile. Building up, hmm. you you put it in those oak barrels, or you added like oak chips or something. Oak, oak chips, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, which kind of speeds up the process too, doesn't it? To get some oak flavor in there, yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And they're virgin, so the tannins are much more pronounced than a oak barrel. Hmm. So, and then you can control better because you can do it by taste. You can add it and uh, make it be in contact with beer for the time you need it to be. Once the taste and flavor is dialed in, you just take it out and remove it from contact with beer. Okay. That's what is the time frame on something like this? Yeah. Uh, you mean the whole process? Yeah. Well, just bring a regular beer, then we send it out to a freeze house. Uh, it takes about two weeks to get it completely frozen. And then we receive it back at the brewery. It's huge, a huge mess. IBC <laughs> containers laying around the brewery, you know. Stacking onto each other, uh, octopus <laughs> yeah. of uh, hoses, dragging on the floor, and then uh, we uh, start the distillation process. That's just letting the beer thaw slowly and uh, moving into a bright tank wow. with the flow meter, so we know. And then we usually go by taste and ABV concentration because you can stop the process a bit too early, and then it's too alcoholic. So we try to dial in volume, ABV, and flavor those three parameters once it's done then we do the adjuncts of the fruit chocolate vanilla and so on so in other words the most difficult beer in the world i didn't even think about having to send it somewhere to be frozen i assumed you do that in the in the fermenter in your refrigerator well no i just thought you an industrial size glycol system could freeze but it's no. not that's not the case can't get that cold. what what temperature do you have to get to you've got to get 
you know, uh, minus something C, uh, you know, you got to get uh, generally when we freeze beer in the U.S., we need to get down to, you know, we, we'll put it in a, in a, in a minus four minus oh uh, really something uh, wow. fahrenheit you know okay that's way yeah. down there okay it's like a standard freezer i see we'll do it yeah. okay but a glycol system on a conical fermenter can't do that your is glycol what is generally running around 29 degrees fahrenheit 28 degrees fahrenheit okay because you're using glycol um mm-hmm. uh you, you really you're really not going to get it lower than that okay you know you can, but yeah, it's just just not a realistic thing. And the you know a beer once you get to six seven percent, they won't freeze at all at those temperatures. I see, or to any of you know even even lower than that won't freeze. Wow. So what are these containers you're shipping it off in? Like big plastic totes or what? Yeah, yeah just IBC. a plastic tote like an IBC container. Yeah, with a metal cage. It with beer. I know. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there are those. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay, and then just so I understand, then you get it back. And in this slow thawing process, you have to carefully transfer it to another vessel at a flow rate that matches the thaw rate that you're looking for so that you're not just transferring alcohol or not just transferring back what you sent away anyway. Am I understanding that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot of work, but yeah, we do that twice a year, so... Okay. It's, uh, reasonable. <laughs> Two days of no sleeping. We should do our next show on one of those y- <laughs> days of the year because you're going to be awake anyway. So, <laughs> um, do you make money on this beer? <clears throat> Good question. We do. I have no idea, man. I'm the brewer. I, don't know about that. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> See, that's why the two of you never should have started a brewer. I know. <laughs> the, Terrible uh, idea. At, at Heretic, we did freeze beer in a tank. We, we've got one little uh, yeast propagation tank. Mm-hmm. It's like a five-barrel tank, and it uh, it doesn't use glycol. It uses refrigerant. Okay. And so with refrigerant, we we're able to freeze it in that tank. I see. So we're able to do that. So you did one that way. Yes. Well, and at the break, you just taught me, Jamil, I, I find this astonishing, right. that Icebox, essentially, the process is illegal, illegal in the U.S. In the U.S., yeah. I didn't know that. Well, you can't freeze distill past like a 0.4% um, maximum. It, 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 they generally allow the breweries to do it because of all the ice beers in the U.S. Okay. Miller Ice and, you know, right. whatever ice. I thought that was just a name. Ice. I didn't even think right. they were icing those beers. What they do is they freeze it and then they, I don't know, they water it back or whatever. But Okay. They have to get approximately to the same. You can't concentrate stuff because that's considered distilling in the U.S. Okay. So you have to have a distillery license. So I, I submitted. I I, I told a home brewer I would brew their ice block because uh, for because I'm Jamil. <laughs> well, for the home brewer <laughs> conference. Do what I want. Okay. And yeah. so um, I applied to the the TTB the, for under the, our distillery license. To, to freeze to still this thing and they told me no can't do that this is a beer submit it as a beer i'm like okay but yeah I, it's not allowed to concentrate it this much under the beer license so right i submit it as a beer and they're like you can't do this so you freeze concentrate too much i'm like yes i know i told you that's why i submitted it as a distillery item and the beer person goes like, well, okay, activate that and I'll approve it. I'm like, okay. So I reactivated my distilling application for this, for this beer and I see. they approved it. So the problem is it's taxed as a spirit. Okay. So it's a much higher tax rate, but still um, we got to legally produce an ice block in the okay. U.S. But of course that goes back to Jason's question, how do you make money on a beer like that? Because you would have had to charge me. No, you don't. Yeah. But who okay. cares? Right. You know, that's not the reason you open a brewery. If you if you're opening a brewery to make money, <laughs> you're an idiot. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um and then, so the other, just to point this out, and we've been talking about it casually the whole time, all of these styles are in cans for you guys. And here in the U.S., now you might find some the breweries putting these styles in cans, but in general, more, more, they're, more. they're still doing bottles. Yeah. Um, but do you guys do any bottle products? Is it everything cans for you? 
Yeah, it's minimal amount. We have this uh, membership uh, club where we do some bottles. Yeah. And that's about it. Everything else is uh, cans. It's just easier to have a streamlined yeah. format for us to make production to be a bit more leaner and just be able to make volume. Okay. And just eases out the process a lot. Okay. And then, so that means everything is carbonated in the tanks before you guys can, too, yeah. right? There's no sort of can yeah. conditioning. You can't do that. Okay. No, no, no can conditioning. Everything is carbonated when it goes to cans. Yeah. Um, well, then, which also, I think, helps you dial it in, because that was another thing I noticed. Each and every one of these, like, carbonation right where it should be, right to the style, or at least, I don't know, they're not even styles, right to where they taste great with, the, with what you've produced, including this one. Just, like, a little bit of carbonic bite there. Hmm. Yeah, we got pretty good uh, equipment to measure carbonation and all that, so we have our process pretty well dialed in. It comes the engineering set of eyes. They yeah. really want to have the numbers dialed in, the equipment. They don't look at the expense. If that's the equipment we need, that's the equipment we get to get the results they want. So yeah, can't complain about that. Love it. I wish I could afford an Anton Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you know. You know, should have found brothers that are engineers. I don't I know. have to tell you, Jason. <laughs> well, George, uh, I, I know it's getting awful late there, um, and, we, and we've gotten through, well, at least what we can handle getting through today, right. I think. Um, uh, thank you so much for being on the show and, and, and really for, for sending that beer with these guys because it's all just fantastic. No, it was a pleasure being here, and uh, next time they'll – take even more beer <laughs> 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 in a bigger suitcase yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah now that we know about you i'll be requesting more the next time everything <laughs> uh, george to uh from more schleudel uh, you can go to more um figure out how to spell it you'll find it on google there uh and they are in the <laughs> netherlands um and you can look at they've uh, all of the beers that we talked about I, I i found them on the website so you can read more about them you can meet the team on the website the the family's there it's actually a really well done uh uh, uh, web presence that you guys have too so people can learn plenty about you um and man i just i wish you luck do you do you, are you are you are you now a netherlands resident is this your is this your your home for the foreseeable yeah. future yeah yeah that's uh, where i live now so uh, i like it can, uh, find me around the, in Alkmaar in the netherlands so if you're ever around just let me know good for you i'm ready to move jamil I am too. Right? Let's go. Every, especially if you look, not just in the U.S., but just particularly California. Everybody's ready to go. <laughs> You're from California. <laughs> All right, George. Thank you again for being with us, Jamil. Uh, and, and Jason, thanks for lugging the beer all across hey. Europe and to and, and then You're across welcome. the pond, man. Yeah, sorry, Jason. Thank yeah. you for... <laughs> we should we should have just drank it ourselves. <laughs> it, there was a couple days we got pretty close. Yes. <laughs> Where you, you're just short on beer that day and just needed... You could have opened a couple. I mean, come on. No one yeah, would have, no yeah, one would you have start been. opening one. You know what happens. Yeah, so, yeah. Soon you have an empty Slippery box. Slippery slope. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for joining us here today on The Session. You can find more sessions all the time. Subscribe on iTunes and every other place you'd like to do it. Thanks to our sponsor, More Beer. Thanks to our sponsor, the 21st Amendment Brewery. Uh, they've always uh, been with us since the beginning, and we appreciate that. You can hit the donate button on our homepage, and uh, that helps us out. Uh, you can do your Amazon shopping by clicking the Amazon link. And that helps us out. Um, and just support all of our sponsors, Williams Brewing, um, people that have been with us all these years, really keeping uh, the Brewing Network alive, and, and we appreciate it. Um, uh, thanks again to, to Jay-Z uh, for always being around and doing great content for us, and Jason for hanging out today. And we'll see you next time right here on The Session. Session is a production of the Brewing Network and brought to you by More Beer. Check them out at morebeer.com. Find more content and live video of this show on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brewing network. For sponsorship opportunities and information, please reach out to advertising at thebrewingnetwork.com. To reach our hosts, contact feedback at thebrewingnetwork.com. 